Assalamualaikum and a very good day to all of our students. So today I will be giving a lecture on uh, pneumonia. So uh, in general, pneumonia can be uh, classified into typical and uh, atypical pneumonia. And there will be uh, a lot of uh, sub-classification on the topic. So these are the learning objectives for today's lecture. So uh, <clears throat> you must know what is the epidemiology of the uh, pneumon typical pneumonia, the classification and the causes of typical pneumonia. The causes here refers to the, uh, the pathogen, the causative agents, and what are the occupational factors uh, which is associated with uh, typical pneumonia, what are the pathologic features of typical pneumonia, what are the clinical features of typical pneumonia, principle of management of typical pneumonia. Uh, this also include prevention and also complications of uh, typical pneumonia. So uh, as an introduction, pneumonia is broadly defined by uh, any infection uh, to lung parenchyma. This infection uh, can be caused by bacteria, virus, fungal, or parasitic infection. So it's actually uh, <coughs> quite a broad term. Lah. And it's actually a major cause of death in all age groups. And it is a main cause of death in children in low-income countries. For Malaysia, it is the second cause of death. It accounts for about 11.4% of mortality in year 2021. So what are the at-risk group? So usually the one who is at risk of pneumonia is usually those who age more than 65 years old and also those who age less than 5 years old. Underlying chronic diseases, uh, this include uh, pre-existing lung conditions such as uh, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, as well as uh, any other diseases that cause uh, immunosuppression, for example, uh, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus and also those who who is on uh, <coughs> immunosuppressive therapy and also the one who, who are smoker. Uh, this also include the passive smoker as well. So for pathogenesis, as you know, uh, pneumonia is an infection to the lung parenchyma. So any form of infection, it, uh, the pathogenesis has some form of uh, impairment of the immune, immune system. So this impairment of human immune system uh, usually can be divided into systemic and local uh, immune uh, response for systemic immunosuppression. Usually it is caused by immunologic uh, deficiency uh, such as uh, acute immu uh, immune deficiency, uh, acute uh, immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, which is caused by HIV virus and also those who are on immunosuppressive agent, uh, for example, those uh, with, uh, with cancer who is on chemo chemotherapy drugs, and those who, uh, for example, in uh, renal disease patient in nephrotic syndrome who is on high-dose uh, steroids, this is uh, contributing to the systemic immunosuppression. And we also have impairment of local pulmonary defense. Uh, this pulmonary defense <coughs> leads to uh, easier access of the organism into the lung. So what are the uh, impairment of this uh, local pulmonary defense? The first one is the loss or suppression of the cough reflex. It is usually uh, can be due to results of altered sensorium, for example, uh, patient with uh, uh, comatic, comatic, comatic patient and also patient who is on anesthesia and uh, because this patient is on uh, on this muscle relaxant so the cough reflex uh, will be would be impaired and also uh, the patient with uh, neuromuscular disorders 
patient on uh, immunosuppressive agent, immunosuppressive drugs, uh, chest pain, or any uh, which may lead to aspiration of gastric contents. <clears throat> the second uh, impairment of uh, local pulmonary defense is a dysfunction of the mucociliary apparatus. Uh, usually, uh, it caused by uh, cigarette smoke uh, because <clears throat> this uh, inhalation of this uh, hot and corrosive gases uh, and also combined with the uh, superimposed viral infection and also genetic uh, disorder genetic defects of ciliary function uh, for example immortal cilia syndrome cause the, the impairment of this mucociliary apparatus therefore there will be increase in secretion uh, so there will be a uh, breeding ground for this uh, pathogen and also accumulation of secretion in conditions such as cystic fibrosis and Bronchial obstruction also uh, leads to this uh, breeding, uh, also can uh, provide breeding ground for this uh, pathogen and also uh, interference with the phagocytic and bactericidal activities of the alveolar macrophages uh, by alcohol, tobacco smoke, uh, anoxia. Anoxia means uh, low on oxygen or oxygen into intoxication, which uh, high uh, partial pressure of oxygen also can cause interference with phagocytic and bactericidal activity of these alveolar macrophages, which is the main uh, local pulmonary defense for this uh, pneumonia. And also pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema also uh, may lead to this uh, pneumonia because of, as I mentioned earlier, if there's a lot of secretion, a lot of mucus uh, within the respiratory tract, it is a breeding ground for this uh, pathogen, all this bacteria, virus. So uh, they, uh, it, it, will be, uh, it will be easier for them to proliferate uh, and cause pneumonia. So what are the classification of pneumonia? So pneumonia usually uh, can be broadly classified uh, into uh, to six uh, subgroup, which is community-acquired pneumonia, hospital-acquired pneumonia, healthcare-associated pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia, chronic pneumonia, and also pneumonia in immunocompromised host. So we move on to community-acquired pneumonia. So it is uh, most commonly caused by streptococcus pneumoniae about 30 to 50% of uh, community acquired pneumonia uh, we couldn't find pathogen isolated uh, but it is commonly caused by bacteria virus and also less commonly fungi uh, for example coccidiodes and histoplasma uh, species uh, one of the common fungi that cause infection to the lung <clears throat> There are special population at risk. This is uh, usually related to uh, occupation and also related to uh, certain behavioral. Uh, so, for example, if patient uh, who exposed to placenta of pregnancy, uh, it he the, that individual will be prone to get uh, Q fever, which is caused by Coxiella bonetti. And those who are sheep wool, sheep wool worker are prone to get bacillus anthracis. This bacillus anthracis also is, uh, is also a bioterrorism agent, uh, most commonly known as anthrax. So it's also can be used uh, in bioterrorism. Uh, and also it has history of being used to kill uh, some political figures. In the West, uh, and also those who uh, have exposed to mouse group grouping, mouse dropping, uh, <coughs> it uh, they are also uh, exposed to this hunter virus. Uh, those who is chronic alcoholism uh, are exposed to Klebsiella pneumoniae and other oral anaerobes. Those who have underlying chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are prone to get this Haemophilus influenza. Uh, those who have underlying cystic fibrosis 
are prone to get this Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Stenotrophonas, Buchholderia species, and also those who have infection with influenza virus can have a superimposed infection or co-existent infection with Staphylococcus aureus. So this Staph aureus actually is a secondary infection uh, following this influenza virus. And those who has this acquired immunodeficiency syndrome are prone to get this pneumocystic, this pneumocystic gyrovacy, uh <clears throat> infection. This uh, organism are uh, previously known as pneumocystic carinae. Now it is uh, the organism changed to this name. And uh, there are certain diseases that we call uh, AIDS defining uh, illness. For example, uh, pneumocystic gyrovisi pneumonia, tuberculosis, uh, certain lymphoma, uh, for example, Burkitt lymphoma. Uh, you must do HIV screening for this patient because this patient, uh, most of the patient actually have underlying undiagnosed uh, acute immunodeficiency syndrome AIDS or uh, underlying HIV infection. Uh, those who is homeless and intravenous drug users also prone to get this community acquired MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or we uh, call it CAMRSA. So this uh, CAMRSA is interesting because MRSA is actually is a is a organism that is, that is resistant to multiple types of antibiotics it is usually uh, usually um, affect those who it stays in the healthcare center that's why it's usually a causative agent for uh, hospital acquired pneumonia however uh, for homeless and intravenous drug user uh, they are prone to get this uh, community acquired uh, medicine uh, MRSA. So this is uh, this is uh, uh, the the common uh, population at risk. So in summary, these are the causative agent for the pneumonia. Pneumonia. So <clears throat> in neonates, usually uh, the causative agent for bacteria is a uh, group B streptococci. Uh, we usually call it GBS and E. coli. Uh, these two uh, organisms, uh, these two bacteria, actually originated from the maternal uh, reproductive tract. So as the baby uh, coming out from the uh, reproductive tract, tract during the delivery, uh, the baby might catch this, uh, this, uh, this bacteria, hence causing the... Uh, <clears throat> the pneumonia, pneumonia in neonatal period. And also, uh, RSV virus, respiratory syncytial virus, also uh, commonly infect this age group. Uh, for infant, uh, the causative uh, organism for bacteria is usually chlamydia trachomatis and streptococcus pneumonia. And also, we just have this RSV and parainfluenza virus. Uh, for children age group, the main causative agent is streptococcus pneumonia and hemophilus influenza. Uh, for uh, virus, uh, the main causative agent is RSV and parainfluenza virus. In young adult, uh, you have uh, the causative agent of streptococcus pneumonia, mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, and it's also for uh, can be caused by various uh, respiratory viruses such as adenovirus. And for older adult, uh, usually it is caused by streptococcus pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, legionella pneumophilia, and usually for virus, it's caused by influenza virus. So <clears throat> for uh, this uh, typical pneumonia, we will focus more on the bacteria. Uh, and for mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, legionella pneumophilia, and also chlamydia uh, sitachi it will be uh, discussed in the next lecture uh, because it's presented uh, differently uh, so this is under atypical pneumonia
Okay, so we move on to hospital acquired pneumonia or HAP. It is uh, defined as pneumonia occurred uh, during or more than 48 hours after admission to hospital that is not present during admission. So this uh, HAP is actually uh, has a different characteristic with uh, community acquired pneumonia because the bacteria uh, that cause the disease usually res have acquired resistance to antibiotic. So usually it is more difficult to treat this uh, pneumonia and usually it leads to higher uh, morbidity and mortality and also uh, higher cost to treat and uh, longer hospital stay. Uh, it is also associated with immunosuppression, particularly in terminally ill patient, patient on immunosuppressive therapy, and, and patient uh, which uh, presented with uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, which has a very high sugar level. So other than that, uh, HAP also associated with this invasive procedure, intubation, uh, for example, uh, because uh, it directly introduced the bacteria uh, into the respiratory tract. Uh, and also, uh, those who has a prolonged hospital stay with multiple injection, because this injection also is an entry point of this organism into the bloodstream. And when the organism enter the bloodstream, uh, sooner or later, it will end up into the lung. Uh, causing the infection, hence leads to pneumonia. And, uh, uh, and it is also associated with uh, contamination of bacteria in equipment, especially the respiratory care unit. For example, uh, all those the uh, all those the intubation sets, all the ventilation sets, it must be clear from this uh, contamination usually needs to be sterilized before it will be used, reused back to another patient. So we move on to uh, healthcare associated pneumonia. It is defined as pneumonia that develops outside the hospital among the patient who had recent or substantial exposure to healthcare setting. Uh, for example, those who has prior hospitalization, those who is on dialysis or residing in nursing home, or those who has uh, who is uh, in on immunocompromised state, so the pathogen uh, usually it's a staph staph aureus. Uh, it can be methicillin resistant, methicillin resi sensitive. This is the normal staph aureus, which usually can be treated by normal penicillin, uh, and also can be caused by uh, staph aureus uh, methicillin resistant, or we call it MRSA, and uh, other than that, it can be caused by uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and also Streptococcus pneumonia. So we move on to uh, aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia is a pneumonia due to aspiration of oral pharyngeal fluid or gastric content into the lung. Uh, it, it is usually <coughs> uh, affect the right middle lobe uh, apical or posterior segment of uh, right lower lobe because this is where the most uh, aspirated material usually end up with. And usually it caused by this anaerobic uh, oral flora. Uh, <coughs> example, Bacteroides, Rivotella, Fusobacterium, Peptostreptococcus. And it is also can be caused by aerobic bacteria, such as Streptococcus pneumoniae, Staph aureus, Haemophilus influenza, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So these are the common pathogens for aspiration pneumonia. So we move on to chronic pneumonia. <coughs> chronic pneumonia is defined as pneumonia that lasts for more than six weeks <coughs> and caused by the uh, microorganism. So the common pathogen uh, pathogens are <coughs> nocaria, actinomyces species, <coughs> and those organisms that induce granulomatous inflammation, for example, mycobacterium tuberculosis and also atypical mycobacteria, histoplasma capsulectum, coccidioides imitis, <coughs> blastomyces dermatitis. So this uh, actually uh, is fungal infection, the one highlighted in red. And I would, not, I would not touch more on that because it will be covered in other lecture. 
Okay, so we move on to pneumonia in immunocompromised hosts. And this is defined as pneumonia occurred in individual with increased susceptibility to infection with organism of little native virulence in normal individual. Means this organism usually if exposed to normal individual, it does not cause uh, pneumonia. But if it is exposed to immunocompromised host, it will lead to pneumonia. Usually it is associated with impairment of any humoral or cell mediated or neutrophil immune defects, either is congenital or acquired. So humoral means the this uh, antibody uh, response means uh, antibody uh, meaning the mechanism of the immune system is via antibody production. Cell mediated means it is via the T cell uh, cytotoxic effect uh, that uh, kills the uh, causative agent. And also the neutrophil also uh, via this uh, via this uh, via this uh, <coughs> either uh, uh, either production of this uh, reactive oxygen species or also the cytokines to induce the uh, bactericidal effect of to kill this uh, bacteria. So usually neutrophil is associated with uh, bacteria immune uh, defense. So if there is uh, neutrophilia or neutrophenia, uh, usually it can be, uh, it can, means if it is uh, neutrophilia, neutrophilia means increase in neutrophil, usually it is associated with bacteria infection. For neutrophenia, usually it is, uh, uh, signaling that uh, there are uh, reduced numbers of neutrophil that uh, that makes the individual uh, prone to get uh, bacterial infection. So what are the pathogens uh, commonly uh, associated with this pneumonia in immunocompromised host is cytomegalovirus, pneumocystis gyrovisi, mycobacterium avium intracellulary complex, Invasive aspergillosis, invasive candidiasis, and other common pathogen. So these are the uh, common uh, causative agent for this pneumonia in immunocompromised host. Uh, <clears throat> we move on to pathologic features of pneumonia. So usually uh, there are two patterns of uh, bacterial pneumonia, which is bronchopneumonia. Bronchopneumonia means there's a patchy involvement of the lung or lobar pneumonia, which involve the segment, uh, the whole segment of the lung. As you can see here, this is the patchy, this is bronchopneumonia, patchy involvement. Lobar pneumonia involve the segment of this uh, lower lobe. <coughs> so for bronchopneumonia, as I mentioned earlier, uh, usually it uh, involves patchy consolidation that may be confined to one lobe, but it is often multi-lobar, means it's two lobes and uh, frequently bilateral and basal because secretion usually tends to end up in the lower lobe because of the gravity. So that's why this uh, lower lobe uh, is prone to get this uh, bronchopneumonia more than the upper lobe. And gross feature, usually you have this slightly elevated uh, granular gray, red eye, yellow to <coughs> Uh, usually yellow, sometimes it appears red uh, with poor de defined margin. So you can see here, uh, this is the ill-defined uh, dry granular yellowish uh, yellowish uh, lesion of the lung. Usually uh, it does not uh, have this infiltrative, uh, how you differentiate with tumor usually uh, infection usually has this uh, has this immune response with necrosis and usually uh, it has this uh, it's usually there's uh, a lot of area of uh, soft area uh, with uh, because of the necrosis and usually the border even though it's irregular it does not uh, looks infiltrative so for microscopy uh, usually you see a lot of neutrophil exudate within the bronchi, bronchioles and adjacent alveolar spaces. So for lobar pneumonia, 
it involves consolidation of large portion of a loop or entire loop. Uh, usually, uh, I, the minimum you must involve uh, a segment of the uh, the uh, the loop of the lung. Sometimes it involves the entire loop. So there are four stages. Usually, start with congestion, where the lung is heavy, boggy, uh, and appears uh, uh, reddish. Uh, grossly uh, by naked eye when we do a biopsy and also uh, assess under microscope uh, usually it has this uh, acute inflammatory uh, picture you have this vascular engorgement intraalveolar edema and also these neutrophils uh, sometimes you can have this <coughs> uh, bacterial colony that uh, indicates the presence of bacteria but uh, it's usually uh, not present because of the uh, active human uh, active immune response that kills the bacteria and then they proceed with red hepatization which uh, the lung appears red firm and airless uh, you you can feel this is like a liver like consistency uh, where this is the 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 stages that uh, the the consistency the lung feel feels a bit hardened like a liver but not too hard like the uh, stony dullness i mean not too hard like the wood consistency because uh, usually uh, it uh, indicates more of malignancy uh, usually for uh, infection it does not Cause it does not cause uh wood woody hard consistency, so for microscopy you can see confluent uh, exudation and neutrophils. Usually this there's a lot of neutrophils uh, clumping together forming micro abscesses, and also you have this uh, RBC and fibrin filling alveolar spaces, and then they proceed to gray hepatization, <coughs> where the color changes from uh, red to gray. Uh, because of the disintegration of uh, RBC with the persistence of fibrinosuppurative exudates. <coughs> so this is uh, what you see under the microscope. Then <coughs> eventually they will go to this uh, resolution stages where it will appear grayish, whitish, fibrotic patches uh, grossly and usually under microscope it appears fibromyxoid mass containing macrophages and fibroblasts. And sometimes if involved the pleura, uh, it leads to this fibrous thickening and adhesion. So the clinical features, uh, usually it is etiologic dependent. For bacterial pneumonia, usually you have acute high-grade fever, chills and rigor, cough with mucopolurans sputum. Uh, sometimes you have hemoptysis. Hemoptysis means coughing out blood. And <clears throat> if there is involvement of the pleura, you have this pleuritic chest pain and pleural friction rub. So pleuritic chest pain, usually when the patient uh, inhale or exhale uh, during movement of the breathing, uh, they will cause chest pain. <clears throat> and uh, in imaging, you have this radio-opaque whole lung uh, whole lung uh, opacity which indicates lobar pneumonia and also you can have this <coughs> patchy radio opaque <coughs> lesion uh, usually <coughs> in bronchopneumonia uh, for lab investigation usually wbc count is high in bacteria especially you have uh, higher neutrophils uh, count uh, which uh, we term as neutrophilia or neutrophilic leukocytosis in 90% of cases of bacterial pneumonia and usually you have uh, high inflammatory markers uh, such as uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate <coughs> or ESR <coughs> or C-reactive protein uh, usually the elevation will be marked uh, commonly more than 100 millimeter per hour for, and, uh, also for ESR and 100 uh, milligram per liter for CRP and uh, usually you need to do sputum and blood culture and sensitivity this is uh, to this is the gold standard particularly sputum culture 
to diagnose pneumonia <coughs> and also it is uh, useful to determine the uh, administration of antibiotic choice because we want the uh, organism respond to whatever antibiotic we are giving so we if let's say the uh, the causative organism is resistant to for example penicillin we should give <coughs> the antibiotic uh, other antibiotic which covers the antibiotic uh, which covers the bactericidal effect of the bacteria and also we have to do hiv testing if suspect immunodeficiency and also if uh, the patient has AIDS defining illness, for example, tuberculosis or uh, pneumocystic gerovocyte pneumonia. So the principle of management, uh, most mild cases are usually treated uh, as outpatient. Uh, usually the doctor will give uh, penicillin, usually oral amoxicillin or clarithromycin or doxycycline if there is evidence of penicillin allergy. In severe cases, usually, first of all, any severe cases, any emergency, you need to secure airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, you need to provide oxygen supplementation, uh, particularly in respiratory distress. And usually, you need ICU for ventilation if indicated. You need to prescribe antibiotics depending on etiologic organism. Usually, this is the current guideline. You need to administer oral antibiotic or clarithromycin or clarithromycin with third generation cephalosporin. Uh, for example, the example of third generation cephalosporin is captriaxone. And for uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus or MRSA, usually the first line is vancomycin and also the second line onwards is uh, daptomycin, tacoplanin, and also ceftarolin. <clears throat> and also, if patient has evidence of uh, septic shock, you need to support with IV fluids. Uh, you need to do chest physiotherapy to clear up the secretion. Uh, and also, you need to do thromboprophylaxis because this patient will be bed bound and doesn't move uh, a lot. So they are prone to get uh, deep vein thrombosis and also this may lead to uh, pulmonary embolism. And also because of this pleuritic chest pain and uh, uh, other, uh, <coughs> other, other pain elsewhere, sometimes uh, you, when the patient have high grade fever, you will have this uh, very severe myalgia. Uh, that's why usually that we will cover it also with analgesia. Uh, complication in general, uh, complication of pneumonia is respiratory failure and also sepsis, which in turn will lead to multi-organ failure. And of course, uh, for local complication, uh, <clears throat> it will lead to abscess formation, empyema, pleural effusion, and also uh, if it is uh, if it is organized, means there's a human immune response to it, it will lead to organizing pneumonia. So this uh, respiratory failure and sepsis, if it is not treated properly, it will end up with uh, mortality, which the patient died. Lah. So uh, that's why it's actually, pneumonia is very treatable condition, uh, but we need to uh, treat the patient aggressively. Okay, <clears throat> this is actually a quite broad topic by itself, uh, but uh, in Sabah, it's actually, it is one of the most common uh, illnesses, uh, communicable diseases in Sabah. So, uh, I also need to cover in the uh, pneumonia as well. So, TB is uh, actually is uh, quite... Uh, uh, prominent public health uh, public health communicable diseases uh, the incidence for Malaysia in 2015 was 79 per 100,000 population <clears throat> the causative agent usually the most common of course is mycobacterium tuberculosis and it is also can be caused by non tuberculous mycobacterium for example mycobacterium avium complex 
Mycobacterium intracellulare, Myco, Mycobacterium avium, Mycobacterium abscessus complex, Mycobacterium mesiliense, Mycobacterium boleti, Mycobacterium kansasi. So these are the <coughs> the other non tuberculous Mycobacterium that cause uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. So the clinical infection usually can be divided to, into active infection, which is symptomatic, and latent uh, infection, which is asymptomatic. The mode of transmission, uh, usually it's from the respiratory droplets. Uh, and for non-tuberculous mycobacterium, it can be uh, transmitted through soil and water, which in turn uh, goes to the bloodstream. Uh, because the soil and water sometimes it is uh, uh, <clears throat> it will uh, somehow uh, sooner or later will enter the bloodstream then the bloodstream the this uh, uh, non-tuberculous mycobacterium would end up ultimately in the lung causing the infection so what are the predisposing factor for pulmonary tuberculosis uh, these are the common one crowded living condition uh, such as uh, the individual in prisons, homeless shelters, and long-term care, uh, individual with HIV AIDS, individual with diabetes, particularly particularly uncontrolled diabetes. Now in Malaysia, in uh, clinical practice guideline, all diabetic patient needs to underwent at least yearly uh, tuberculosis screening. Uh, those who has Hodgkin lymphoma chronic lung diseases, particularly silicosis, chronic kidney disease, malnutrition, alcoholism, and immunosuppression. These are the common predisposing factors of pulmonary tuberculosis. <clears throat> so, what are the pathogenesis of uh, PTB? Uh, usually, <clears throat> there is, uh, uh, if the infection occur before activation of cell-mediated immunity, uh, means uh, usually infection uh, uh, in those who has either cell mediated immunity impairment or those who has not been vaccinated before. So usually the mycobacterium will bind to this menos C3B uh, and menos receptor. Lah. So this uh, receptor will facilitate the entry of the mycobacterium into the alveolar macrophages. So this <coughs> uh, alveolar macrophages uh, underwent phagosomal manipulation by the mycobacterium where uh, there is uh, maturation arrest of the uh, macrophages because usually uh, if any organism ingested by the macrophages, usually they will underwent some form of maturation uh, so that they will uh, kill the organism within the macrophage but usually in tb uh, this organism will cause maturation arrest uh, and also cause lack of acid ph uh, and this will lead to ineffective phagolysosome formation so uh, this will become the seeding uh, ground of the a uh, breeding ground of the bacilli and then this bacilli will spread to multiple sites, uh, hence causing the infection. So <clears throat> those who uh, has the initiation uh, of cell-mediated immunity, usually you have this uh, <clears throat> you have this uh, T helper one uh, T helper T cell helper one uh, immune uh, immune response which usually secrete interferon gamma. So usually those who already vaccinated with the uh, uh, BCG, the TB vaccine, uh, we usually uh, will has this uh, immunity. Then if you do a tuberculin test, usually it has uh, uh, some form of positivity. Uh, and this will lead to activation of macrophages if let's say there is exposure to TB and this uh, macrophage activation will lead to this maturation of these macrophages and phagolysosome uh, maturation, production of nitrous oxide and reactive oxygen species uh, that ultimately leads to 
bacteria, mycobacterial killing. However, in other instances, sometimes it will take uh if let's say the exposure is uh is very high means it has a close contact with the patient with uh, tuberculosis pulmonary tuberculosis usually it has uh higher bacilli loads to these uh, macrophages hence there will be activation of chemokines and tumor necrosis factor and there will be more uh, monocyte monocyte is actually a uh, it's a macrophage within the blood vessel. Then there will monocyte recruitment to the tissue, uh, which leads to uh, clumping aggregation of these macrophages and leads to caseous necrosis and granuloma formation. <clears throat> so this is how uh, the pathogenesis of the PTB uh, infection. So the outcome of infection in previously unexposed immunocompetent person depends on the development of anti-mycobactericidal T-cell mediated immunity, particularly the T-helper cell. So immunity to mycobacterial tuberculosis, uh, as I mentioned, is primarily mediated to T-helper 1 cells, which simulate the macrophage to kill the bacteria. <clears throat> and uh, there are two spectrum of infection in uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. You have primary tuberculosis, which usually the first infection in previously unexposed and unsensitized, unsensitized person. And you have secondary tuberculosis, which occurs in individuals who has been previously infected with tuberculosis. So these are the spectrum of PTB infection. So this uh, the duration, weeks to months. So usually <clears throat> for primary infection, usually it cause primary complex and usually it ha it causes a localized caseation. Uh, usually we term it a con uh, focus. Usually this uh, caseation is uh, very localized, means very small, and usually it will heal by itself. Or it can uh, grow dormant uh, in the later, latent uh, lesion. It will lead to formation of the latent lesion uh, where the organism it is dormant either in the pulmonary or extrapulmonary. And uh, for primary lesion also, if it is uh, there is problem with the immunity, it will lead to progressive primary tuberculosis, uh, whereby you have this uh, massive hematogenous dissemination that leads to miliary tuberculosis. Uh, miliary tuberculosis, I will explain later how it looks like. Basically, it's a millet of the tuberculosis uh, focus <clears throat> and that leads to this uh, multiple in type of, uh, infection to multiple sites. And usually, as a time progress, it will lead to, for later lesion, it can lead to reactivation that cause secondary tuberculosis or reinfection that cause secondary tuberculosis. So usually secondary tuberculosis can be due to reactivation of the latent lesion, means the infection has already been present within the lung or outside the lung, but it remains dormant, uh, which reactivate after uh, the individual uh, has some form of immunosuppression. For example, previously the first individual is healthy suddenly uh, he was diagnosed with cancer then the cancer caused immunosuppression then caused the reactivation of this late condition caused secondary tuberculosis and also those who has previous infection but has another exposure to tuberculosis also can cause secondary tuberculosis usually the secondary tuberculosis has a higher caseating uh, lesion higher means uh, has a higher density of the uh, caseation, means higher density of the granuloma formation, then that leads to uh, cavity formation and also high uh, a lot of scar formation, particularly involving the uh, upper lobe of the lung. And usually can be progressed to progressive secondary tuberculosis that leads to massive hematogenous dissemination that leads to miliary tuberculosis. <coughs> so these are the spectrum of uh, pulmonary tuberculosis infection. 
So for pathologic features of primary tuberculosis, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, uh, grossly you can see gone focus. <coughs> Usually it is uh, 1 to 1.5 uh, centimeter of gray white area <coughs> with consolidation after initial infection, commonly at the lower part of the upper lobe uh, of the lung or upper part of the lower lobe of the lung because usually it's close to the pleura <coughs> and also it can be uh, it can be uh, presented grossly as gone complex where you have caseous necrosis in the center of gone focus and the bacilli drains to uh, regional nodes often caseate then this lymph node actually often also have casation necrosis so which also uh, terms as uh, tuberculous lymphadenitis so this uh, under the microscope this lesion looks uh, uh, which has this granulomatous inflammation uh, whereby you have this uh, caseating granulomatous inflammation which central caseation uh, usually rimmed by the lymphocyte and usually sometimes uh, the patient might have non-caseating lesion. In immunocompromised patient, it lacks the characteristic granuloma and usually when you do a, a zilnil sustain, these macrophages uh, contain many bacilli because uh, there's an impairment of this uh, immune response that kill the bacilli. Now, of, uh, about 95% of cases, Cell-mediated immunity usually uh, resolve the infection uh, for primary tuberculosis and usually gone complex undergoes, under, underwent progressive fibrosis followed by radiologically undetectable, uh, radiologically detectable calcification. Means there is a small uh, calcif calcified lesion or sometimes small fibrosis in the lung detected. Uh, and usually, despite seeding to other organs because of the cell-mediated immunity, there is no lesion developed. So usually, 95% of the cases of primary TB is uh, latent cases, which patient doesn't have any symptoms or the symptoms usually is self-limiting and patient does not uh, seek uh, doctor's attention. So most, because most uh, usually eventually resolve uh, by cell mediated immunity so this is how gone uh, complex looks like uh, so uh, <clears throat> gone complex usually <clears throat> there's a gray white uh, parent timer focus uh, usually in the upper lobe and you have this uh, hyla node hyla limb node cassation uh, on the left side uh, on this side the blue arrow Will, uh, which is also has this uh, gray white lesion. Uh, usually the limb node is very small, uh, but this limb node is quite large and it also uh, has this uh, gray white lesion that indicates this uh, uh, granulomatous inflammation. So under microscope, uh, this is actually uh, one of the most, uh, the favorite question. So under microscope, this is how uh, granuloma caseating granuloma looks like you have this central uh, cheesy like usually pinkish cheesy like uh, <coughs> necrosis usually it is rimmed by lymphocyte rimmed by lymphocyte means it is uh, the edge of the this uh, caseating lesion you have this mature lymphocyte and usually uh, within this mature lymphocytes you have this length hand type granul uh, multinucleated giant cell this is how length hand type multinucleated giant cells uh, looks like uh, occasionally in immunocompetent patient and there is a granuloma non casating granuloma which looks like this uh, where you have uh, this uh, granuloma formation uh, by the macrophages and you also have this length hand type uh, multinucleated giant cell so in uh, immunocompetent patient uh, usually you don't have bacilli within the 
alveolar alveolar macrophages. But if you do uh, in immunocompromised patient, uh, the Zill Nielsen stain, uh, usually you can see this uh, red bacilli. Uh, bacilli means rot. It's a rot shape. So red shape and uh, the rod shape, uh, red organism. Uh, so we call it, we call it uh, acid fast organism. So this is, uh, this is um, under Zinnilson stain. So for uh, secondary pulmonary tuberculosis, the pathologic features grossly you can see. Uh, gray white area of caseation particularly uh, leads to uh, cavitation of upper part, usually in both lung. You can see here, this is the gray-white uh, <coughs> caseation. Uh, and also sometimes you can see here areas of fibrosis, uh, the white, whitish, uh, the bright whitish area. This is area of fibrosis. And you, you can see here, these are the cavitation of the lung here. Sometimes it fill with uh, RBC, so that's why it, how, this is how it looks like the cavitation. So, in um, in immunocompetent uh, individual, usually the parenchyma uh, underwent uh, progressive fibrous encapsulation, means the edge of the lesion usually has this fibrous formation or fibrosis. So it uh, it will uh, eventually leads to fibrocalcific scar uh, as the alveolar macrophages kills the bacilli <coughs> eventually. And in older and immunocompromised patient, usually it progress to a progressive pulmonary tuberculosis where you have this epicalation expanded into the adjacent lung and eventually erodes into bronchi and vessel which leads to hemoptysis and the initial caseous necrosis center will become ragged, irregular, and usually it doesn't have this uh, a wall of fibrous tissue. So usually this is, uh, most likely this is from the immunocompetent patient because you can see very nice uh, bright area of fibrosis at the edge of the lesion. But if it is in older <clears throat> or immunocompromised patient, you might not see this because this is part of the healing process. So in immunocompromised patient, the healing process will be delayed. And microscopically, uh, usually it's same. It causes central caseation. Uh, usually, uh, bacilli can be seen in by Zill Nielsen stain in early exudative and caseous phase of the granuloma formation. And usually, it's very few in the late uh, fibrofalsific stage because of the healing process. And with adequate treatment, the process may be arrested and cavity. However, the cavity may persist or become fibrotic. So if the treatment is in inadequate or in immunodeficiency patient, infection may spread uh, via the airways, lymphatic or vascular system uh, towards other organs as well. Uh, and also, this also can be leads to miliary pulmonary tuberculosis where the organism draining through the lymphatic channels enter the venous blood and circulate back to the lung which uh, appears microscopic or very small visible 2 mm foci of yellow white consolidation scattered towards the lung parenchyma that's why in uh, this x-ray you can see it's a uh, small small dots, small small uh, whitish dots. We, we call it millets in the in the X-ray. That's why it's uh, termed as miliary tuberculosis. <clears throat> so miliary lesion also may expand and form mass, resulting in consolidation in large region of the whole lobes of the lung, uh, large large region of the lung, or the, involving the whole lobe of the lung, and with progression it leads to uh, we, it will affect the pleural cavity and also cause pleural effusion, tuberculosis and pyema, and also obliterative fibrous pleuritis. So, clinical features for latent TB, uh, the patient is asymptomatic. For active TB, usually patient in adult usually produce a chronic productive cough, uh, chronic productive cough, uh, 
uh, some uh, usually with hemoptysis, uh, loss of appetite, loss of weight, fever and night sweats. Fever usually is low grade and night sweat and fatigue is prominent. So you uh, basically uh, after you graduated later, any uh, cough of more than two weeks, please ask for these symptoms. Uh, hemoptysis, loss of appetite, loss of weight, and night sweats. This is the symptoms of PTB. And for children, the symptoms, uh, uh, children, the symptoms also similar to adult, but also include anorexia, failure to thrive, not eating well, decreased activity, or decreased playfulness. It means suddenly not active. Failure to thrive means uh, it, it is not gaining weight and it is not achieved the developmental milestone according to age. Uh, and this usually uh, common in children less than five years old of age. Usually in children uh, who is older, usually the symptoms more resembles to the adult active uh, PTB. So the diagnosis usually, we start off with, uh, of course, with uh, history and clinical examination. And then uh, we, <clears throat> we do x-ray, usually we'll uh, have this consolidation or cavitation of the lung. For miliary TB, you have one to three mm diameter of opacity uh, to uh, separate, uh, which affect uh, homogeneously in both uh, left and right lobes of the lung. Usually, it involves all area of the lung. And uh, of course, you need to uh, you need to isolate the uh, acid fast bacilli. So how we isolate? Usually, we use sputum acid part, uh, sputum AFB test, sputum culture uh, of mycobacterium, uh, and also uh, in this era, we sometimes we use this gene expert or expert ultra where you can get the uh, results in less than uh, 12 hours uh, it's very fast usually split of fb it it is done manually so usually it takes uh, three days to one week for sputum culture because this is a acid fast organism usually it grows after three two to three months so the culture will takes longer time and in difficult case, uh, or in extra pulmonary TB cases, usually we diagnose by biopsy. And usually for latent TB, we diagnose by IGRA or interferon gamma release assay and tuberculin, tub, tub, tuberculin skin test uh, positive uh, after exclusion of active TB. Tuberculin skin test, also known as MANTU test. So this usually, if let's say both of IGRA and MANTU tests are positive, uh, you need to exclude active TB first before you label the patient as latent TB. Because active TB, usually you need different treatment and you need to isolate the patient because this patient is highly infectious to others. So the principal management, you need to notify to the nearest healthcare mandatory within six seven mandatory within seven days otherwise you will you will be fine uh, and usually for first line treatment you need for ptb you have six months of treatment uh, two months of ehrz etambutol isonizat rifampicin and pirazinamide and four months of hr which is isonizat and rifampicin these are the first line of treatment. Uh, I don't explain more of the second line because I don't think it is uh, your level yet. Uh, usually, it will be teach in the final year, uh, med, uh, final year medical posting. So, uh, other than that, you need to screen for family members and close contact for possible spreading of the pulmonary tuberculosis. So, for prevention in general, uh, need to wear masks. Uh, in PTB, you need to wear N95, uh, meaning if you wear mask near the patient with PTB, uh, you will you can get infected as well. Uh, so it does not provide uh, 
extra protection need to get this N95 mask for PTB. For viral diseases, bacterial diseases, you can use a three-ply mask, which uh, we use currently in our COVID pandemic as well. And of course, you need to have a good hand hygiene, uh, smoking cessation, and also, of course, uh, <clears throat> you need to vaccinate yourself. Uh, okay, you for vaccination, uh, particularly uh, pneumococcal vaccination, uh, because the most common causative uh, agent is streptococcus pneumoniae. So we have this uh, two types of vaccination. You have this conjugate vaccine and polysaccharide vaccine. Conjugate vaccine usually is more effective, but it's more expensive uh, than polysaccharide vaccine. And of course, you have also influenza vaccination. Uh, usually, it, ha it is a quadrivalent vaccine. It covers two types of influenza, which is influenza A, A and influenza B. Usually, it covers two strain of this influenza A and B. However, usually this vaccination needs to be taken yearly why yearly because uh, you have this antigenic drift so <clears throat> after one year the influenza will easily mutate its antigen so this vaccine might not work uh, in the next year so that's why usually influenza vaccine it will uh, it will update uh, the new uh, vaccine vaccination regime uh, frequently because of this. So you need, as a healthcare personnel, uh, usually they encourage you to take yearly influenza vaccine. It's usually free of charge for healthcare personnel. Okay, uh, that's all for my lecture. For this, are my references. So uh, that's the end of my lecture. So, please uh, scan your attendance uh, in HR online. The attendance will be available uh, during the stipulated time of your schedule. And uh, for any questions, uh, please ask in the forum. I have prepared the forum for you to ask uh, questions related to the topics or any question that is taught by me. You can ask that question. So uh, that's all from me uh, regarding this topic. Uh, thank you very much.